a paralyzed parliament amid increased tension in international affairs. This is Now You Know. I'm Rob Snow. The top news stories. And conversations that matter to you. This is Now You Know with Rob Snow on News Radio. A new political week begins, but on Parliament Hill, it's the same old, same old. The House of Commons may be back in session, but nothing is getting done, and nothing has been getting done for about a month. The House of Commons is at a standstill over what's been called the Green Slush Fund. The opposition parties led by the Conservatives have demanded that the Liberals hand over to Parliament all the documents related to the so-called Green Slush Fund, The Conservatives then say they plan to give those documents to the RCMP. The Liberals are still refusing to hand over all of those documents. The Speaker of the House ruled this is a case of privilege and that Parliament should get those documents. But because if it's a case of privilege, no other business in the House of Commons can be dealt with until this is dealt with. Conservative MP Michael Barrett explains why the House remains paralyzed. Look, the House is seized with multiple issues of liberal corruption that um, that actually don't even include the issue that uh, we've raised today, this latest issue. But uh, the the most recent one to seize the House, that's one uh, caused by the Liberals allowing for hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, dozens of conflicts of interest to flow inappropriately uh, to Liberal insiders under a Liberal appointed chair who was found guilty of breaking Canada's Conflict of Interest Act. A majority of members of the House of Commons did vote ordering the government to turn over its documents uh, to the RCMP so that they can review them and and take uh, appropriate decisions. But the government is in violation of that order as ruled by the Speaker of the House and that uh, matter can be uh, dispensed with very quickly. The government simply has to follow uh, the, the will, the order of a majority of members that were democratically elected to the House of Commons, which they were not doing right now. On the government side, the Liberals say these are all just political games being played by the Conservatives. This is the government House leader, Karina Gould. Look, what the Conservatives are doing in the House of Commons right now is just plain wrong. They are trying to use their extraordinary powers and they are abusing those powers of the House of Commons, of parliamentarians, to get around due process, to get around the judicial process in Canada. Just yesterday in the Hill Times, a former senior official in the parliamentary law clerk's officer said it's time for them to admit they were wrong and to get on with the business of governing. He said this is an abuse of power and it sets an incredibly dangerous precedent uh, for Parliament to request documents not for its own use but to be given to a third party. And he said that that could actually create a constitutional issue and that the courts would have the ability to rule against that. So, you know, it's time for the Conservatives to stop playing these games and quite frankly they're dangerous games because they're playing their political games on the backs of Canadians. They're playing with the rights of Canadians, they're playing with our democratic institutions and the very important separation of powers in our country. This impasse could end if the Liberals could pass what's called a closure motion. But to do that, they would need the support of one of the other opposition parties, and none of them have indicated they're willing to do that just yet. Mr. Trudeau isn't in Canada. He's attending back-to-back summits. He was in Lima, Peru for an APEC meeting. He's now in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil for the G20. But in advance of his departure, his team released a video of the Prime Minister explaining his government's reversal of course on immigration. Trudeau claims his government increased immigration levels at the behest of premiers and business groups who were complaining of pandemic-related labor shortages. He says the system was then taken advantage of by bad actors. Some saw that as an opportunity to profit, to game the system. We've seen way too many large corporations doing this. The government says the program has been used to get around hiring Canadian workers in some instances. Far too many colleges and universities used international students to raise their bottom line. There are the diploma equivalent of puppy mills that are just churning out diplomas. There is fraud and abuse and it needs to end. Because they could charge these students tens of thousands of dollars more for the same degree. And then there are really bad actors who outright exploit people. 
who target vulnerable immigrants with promises of jobs, diplomas, and easy pathways to citizenship, promises that would never come true. Justin Trudeau wasn't the only politician posting videos on social media over the weekend. Conservative leader Pierre Paglia posted a new video. It's called The Woke, Weird, Wacko World of Justin Trudeau. Too woke? Hey, Pierre Polyev, it's time for you to wake up. Owing controversy surrounding an Ottawa high school that played an Arabic language song which has been linked to protests of the Israel-Hamas conflict. It happened during a Remembrance Day ceremony yesterday. The federal government calls its new passport design a celebration of national identity. The new travel document doesn't include any tributes to veterans. Even an image of Terry Fox is gone. Meanwhile, there's the situation in Ukraine. Outgoing U.S. President Joe Biden has authorized Ukraine to use long-range American missiles to attack targets inside Russia. Also, the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz spoke on Friday with Vladimir Putin. In Lima at the APEC meeting, Mr. Trudeau was asked about another NATO leader speaking with Putin. I think we all understand how important it is to see an end to the violence in Ukraine, to see an end to conflicts around the world, and that uh, requires a level of engagement uh, with, uh, uh, with counterparts who, uh, in many cases, we disagree with. Um, I, I know there's a lot of work to do to see the conflict in uh, the illegal invasion of Ukraine uh, ended. Um, we're continuing to engage closely with, uh, with uh, Zelensky and with Ukrainians. Uh, I think it's uh, a good thing that there are conversations around this, but the level of trust uh, that I have for Vladimir Putin is probably at an all-time low right now. Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, made a speech to Ukrainians over the weekend. He never acknowledged that the United States had given him permission to use American missiles to hit Russian targets, only that the missiles would speak for themselves. The plan to strengthen Ukraine is a victory plan. I presented it to our partners. One of its main points is to equip our army with long-range capabilities. Today, there is a great deal of discussion in the media about us receiving permission for these actions. But strikes are not made with words. These matters are not announced. The missiles will speak for themselves. A Kremlin spokesperson today referred journalists to a statement made by Vladimir Putin in September. In that statement, he said allowing Ukraine to target Russia would significantly raise the stakes in the conflict and that it would mean that NATO countries are at war with Russia. I'm Rob Snow. This is Now You Know on News Radio. Critical thinking is not dead. Now you know with Rob Snow. Returns on News Radio. The United States will allow Ukraine to use American supplied longer range weapons to conduct strikes inside Russian territory. That is something Ukraine has long asked for, but that the Biden administration has been against, wanting to avoid any escalation that could draw the United States and NATO allies into a direct conflict with Russia. Retired Colonel Rich Outson is a senior fellow with the Atlantic Council. Thanks for joining us. Good to be with you, Rob. What is your reaction to this decision from the Biden administration? Well, I I favor it. I think it's a good decision, though long overdue. Uh, The Biden administration, in in my uh, view, has been a little over timid in terms of escalation dynamics uh, during this aggressive war by Russia against Ukraine. And Frankly, the, the idea that the Russians are free to attack into Ukraine every day with rockets, missiles, and drones, uh, but the Ukrainians will not be allowed to use Western-provided uh, weaponry to, to give them, in response, the same treatment, is, in my view, morally unsustainable and uh, operationally not very practical. Why would it allow Ukraine to do this now? What do you think may have been a turning point? There's a couple things that play into this. The, the first is that the Russians uh, argu- arguably have made a further escalation by bringing 10,000 North Korean troops onto their territory to assist with the 50,000 they've already got in place to try to retake the town of Kursk. Now, Kursk is, in a sense, uh, uh, symbolically important. It's the only big town in Russia that Ukraine has seized. 
uh, as part of the war. And frankly, in, in negotiations, which I think may happen in 2025, Possession of Kursk for the Ukrainians is sort of a guarantee that they'll be able to bargain back for some of their own territory currently occupied by the Russians. So that's one. The, the second is that uh, the clock is ticking for Team Biden, right? The January 21st, the new Trump administration will start. There's $7 billion of aid in the pipeline. He wants to accelerate as much of that as possible. And also uh, sort of with some lack of clarity about what the Trump administration will do on Ukraine, he wants to provide a strong punch uh, capability to the Ukrainians before he leaves office. What do you think will be the reaction from Russia? Well, Russia has this very refined uh, technique of threatening any assistance to Ukraine, uh, leading to another escalation. So, uh, you know, if you study the history of warfare, one side saying, well, if you do that, I'm going to hit you even harder. Uh, well, show me, right? Because they're already hitting pretty hard. Uh, the, the threshold for what they can do against the U.S., uh, for allowing the ATACMs, these, these long-range missiles, to be used is pretty short. Uh, there are some targets. There's going to be U.S. contractors uh, and things like that conducting work in Ukraine. I suppose they could threaten that, but they're already conducting a, a genocidal war, in my view, against Ukraine. So it's a little laughable to take at face value that they'll further escalate when, in, in reality, they're already doing a lot of damage as it is. What targets can these missiles reach? Well, the, uh, the ATACMS missile, which is launched from a generally a truck-mounted launcher, it's very mobile, which makes it hard to hit before it fires. That's one of its strengths. It has a long range, 100 to 180 miles or so, uh, is, is kind of the sweet spot for it. This is excellent for taking out air defense systems, uh, concentrations of troops, and uh, if there is a, an offensive grouping that Russia is putting together with these North Koreans to, to mass for an attack on Kursk to try to retake it, that would be exactly the sort of concentration of troops that these missiles would be very good at dispersing and, and degrading. So I think it will be still used in a defensive sense uh, to, to hit the Russian troops and sensitive, uh, again, communications or air defense targets that would be necessary for a successful offensive on Kursk. U.S. President-elect Donald Trump said during the campaign that he would move fast to bring this war to an end. What do you think about that claim? Well, I think he's been consistent in saying that, and uh, Putin and others have said, yeah, well, it's not as easy as all that. Uh, I, my view is that uh, Trump's not going to ask Ukraine to roll over on its back and just accept what's been done. He's going he's gonna to try to get a deal. The art of the deal is, is the Trump way. So my view is that he's going to do some version of the following, go first to Zelensky and say, look, you have to follow my lead on negotiations. Uh, if you don't, then I, I may have to cut uh, way back on aid or, or cut it out. But if you do... I'm going to give you enough to make sure you don't lose more than what you've lost already. And then I think he'll go to Putin and he'll say, look, uh, you've just seen a big burst of aid come through. There'll be more if you don't negotiate. The pain level will rise for you. So I I think he'll go to both sides and and try to get some uh, mutually acceptable, as ugly and distasteful as it is to have a negotiated end to an offensive war like this. I think he'll press both sides in that manner. What do you think of Olaf Scholz speaking on the telephone with Vladimir Putin? Yeah, well, see, this is one of the, the dilemmas that we have uh, b- between uh, Russia and the United States, is that we are in an antagonistic position. The United States opposes Russia's aggressive war and many other things that they're doing, malign activities around the globe. But if you cut off communications because they're bad, and so, you, you know, you, you can do deterrence, but you have to signal your deterrence, and that means communicating. So I, I don't think there was a phone call between them. Uh, certainly the, the Russians have denied that that happened. I think it's... Uh, far more prudent at this stage to use intermediaries and back channels. I'm pretty sure that is going on. And frankly, you have to do it. I think if Trump intends to message strength uh, at the same time that he's messaging a desire for negotiations, he's going to have to communicate that to Putin somehow. I doubt it'll be a direct phone call. Um, There's other channels to do it. Okay. Thank you for your time today. All right. Good to talk with you, Rob. Really appreciate it. Retired Colonel Rich Outson, Senior Fellow with the Atlantic Council. I'm Rob Snow. This is Now You Know on News Radio. Now You Know with Rob Snow continues on News Radio. Here with David Smith, the Newsday panel, coming up right after the news. Neil Brody and uh, Jordan Paquette going to join us. Neil uh, worked in the Harper PMO. Jordan Paquette. 
I used to work with uh, Rona, Ambo, Ram, Rona Ambrose when she was a, a cabinet minister in the Harper government. So a couple of old uh, Harper warriors are going to join us for the Newsday panel. Brand new uh, political week. Lots to d- discuss. David is back from his final camping trip of, I would imagine, 2024. Oh, yes. How was it? This will be the last one. It was phenomenal. It was cold. It was cold at times. Oh, but yeah. um, no, it was beautiful. Being out in the in Algonquin Park uh, this time of year, there's, there's just the, the stillness and the silence in the woods oh, yeah. this time of year when there's very little wildlife around, no insects of any kind. And there's a yeah. harsh beauty to the landscape. It's just phenomenal. It was a great trip. And you had the moon? We did. Right? The full, the super almost moon. full moon. Yeah, yeah. The almost full moon, the beaver moon. Yeah, that must have been nice. Oh, it's it quiet, David, because only crazy people like you are camping this time of year. <laughs> we saw, That's why it's so quiet. We saw one other fella at the put-in. He was going out uh, solo for a solo trip to a different lake from where we ended up, but he was the only other human being that we saw the whole time we were out there, just one other person. Well, I have to say, and I don't want to curse it, I mean, we are enjoying, you know, pretty decent weather for this time of year. We've just had, so far, scattered flurries. I mean, in my studio, it's 8 degrees. Uh, Where David is in the heart of the city, it's 9 degrees. It's 11 degrees in Kitchener today, 7 degrees in Halifax. Calgary's the uh, weather loser, Dave. Ouch, yeah, they're having a tough It's brutal in Calgary today. My I'm seeing it all over me. my social media feeds of people slip sliding away. It's snowing pretty hard in Calgary today. Like they are under a snowfall warning, I believe. And what like I find fa- really interesting about this, because one of the shots you had sent me was a, a city bus stuck yeah. going up a hill. I want to know why it is that not one major city in this country can figure out how to put snow tires on a bus. Because the buses here in Ottawa do that as well. They can't handle oh, yeah. any kind of snow. Apparently the same in Calgary. Yeah, I guess so. Especially, you know, these articulated buses like the accordion buses, the engine is in the middle. It causes all kinds of all kinds of problems. So but I'm just looking at like it's winter basically in Calgary. Oh, yeah. I mean, not only does it look like a winter wonderland, but I'm looking at their forecast for the rest of the week. And I'm like, keep it there. Keep <laughs> it there. Do not send that here. Even though I'm ready, okay, I've got the snow tires on the vehicle. I'm ready to go. Do you have your snow tires on yet? No, I I kind of no? talked about. You it. might want to get. You might want to get to it when uh, you look. If this is what is headed our way, Dave, I like to kind of wait it out as long as I can because I'm very cheap and I don't want to replace my snow tires. So I like right. to wait it out as long as I possibly can each year. Uh, I think I'm thinking probably this coming weekend I'll I'll bite the bullet and put them on. But like tomorrow. Their high is plus five. On Wednesday, the daytime high is m- not plus five, minus five, minus oh, five. Gosh, I have to get used that. to saying that now. Oh my gosh! Then on Wednesday, their high for the their daytime high in the afternoon with what little sunlight we get these days, the high is minus nine. On Thursday, the high is minus nine. On Friday, the high is minus 8 with more snow, 5 to 10 centimeters of snow. And then next week, their daytime highs for next week, their daytime highs are like minus 13. Five weeks. Five weeks until Christmas. You might want to get ready, Dave. Uh, You'll have to get ready. uh, It's only a matter of time before it's our turn. And winter will be here soon enough. Newsday panel coming up right after the news. Now you know with Rob Snow continues on News Radio, the Newsday panel. And the gang's all here. Our Newsday panelists today, Neil Brody, conservative strategist, spent some time in the Harper PMO. Welcome back, Neil. Good to hear from you. Good afternoon, Rob. And Jordan Piquette is senior consultant, Blue Sky Strategy Group. Now that's the firm in Ottawa. It's not the social media platform that people are <laughs> it leaving. Stocks in it, though. X. More. Yeah. Okay. How are you, Jordan? Good to hear from you. Great, Rob. Thanks for having me. Hi, All right. Dave. Congratulations Let's on your start. new offices, uh, Jordan. Oh, thanks so much. <laughs> thanks. Beautiful over here. Someone actually asked the other day if we were if we were the social media company. Uh, someone on our floor, and that so explained the difference. So anyway, we're getting some traction on it. That's good. Cool. Cool. Well, look, it's not very often that the prime minister releases a seven-minute video on social media, but he did that to explain his government's change of course on 
immigration. Now, in the video, he really takes no blame or ownership, but rather he pins the blame on people like provincial premiers, on businesses and business groups, on colleges and universities. So let's listen again to a little bit of uh, Prime Minister Trudeau from this video. Some saw that as an opportunity to profit, to game the system. We've seen way too many large corporations doing this. The government says the program has been used to get around hiring Canadian workers in some instances. Far too many colleges and universities used international students to raise their bottom line. There are the diploma equivalent of puppy mills that are just churning out diplomas. There is fraud and abuse and it needs to end. Because they could charge these students tens of thousands of dollars more for the same degree. And then there are really bad actors who outright exploit people, who target vulnerable immigrants with promises of jobs, diplomas, and easy pathways to citizenship, promises that would never come true. Okay, what do you, Jordan, let's start with you this week. What do you, what do you think about some of the Prime Minister's claims here? Yeah, I mean, first off, just the, the, on the video content, I mean, he's clearly trying to emulate what, what uh, Pierre Pauly and the Conservatives have been doing it for a while, uh, these long-form videos, so I expect to see more of that. But let's, let's zero in on the immigration side. I think the Liberals have completely lost the plot on immigration. Uh, they've been in charge of this system for the last nine years. They've been in office. If you dare question any of the numbers before, um, people were written off as, as xenophobic, racist, what have you. Um, so they've been the ones that have been in charge of this. So to try and shift the blame now and try and say, oh, it's, it's everyone else's fault except for ours. Uh, it's the university's fault. It's, uh, it's the province's fault. They're all just trying to take advantage of our system. Well, at the end of the day, they're in office. They're, they're in charge of the immigration system, and they're the ones that, that, that allowed it to get to this point. Now they're realizing with, uh, with public opinion polls, having shifted quite a bit on this, uh, they're trying to play catch up and trying to salvage uh, uh, salvage their their government, um, and it's. Uh, I think Canadians have seen through it again. As I said, I think they've lost the plot on it, and uh, and it's uh, it's it, it's just something that uh, that they're going to have a very difficult time trying to convince Canadians that uh, that they are the ones that can now fix the system. Okay, all right. Uh, what do you think, Neil? What do you think? Uh, well, let me uh, first take you a uh, walk down memory lane, Rob, of all the things that uh, just uh, that are not Justin Trudeau's fault. It's not his fault that he asked prosecutors to drop the criminal charges against SNC Lavalin. It's not his fault that he took a private helicopter to the private island of someone who is lobbying him for money. It wasn't his fault uh, that uh, that he directed the public service. To give a fifty million dollar, seventy million dollar contract to a company that employed his family, you know, th- these are all things that were not uh, his fault. Uh, also, not his fault. It's not his fault that he didn't read memos uh, from his public security officials that uh, there was foreign interference in uh, the 2019-2021 election. That's not his fault. That's why he has staff to read his memos for him. Uh, so, you know, this is just a long. Uh, another thing in a long list of of uh, things that he's done that are not his fault. Uh, but to to Jordan's point, you know, Jordan's a smart guy. He knows exactly what he's talking about. The government of Canada is in charge of issuing visas. Now, presumably, at at the end of the day or at the end of the month or at the end of the year, somebody tabulates up all the visas that have been handed out that year and why they've been handed out, and that will make its way up the chain to at least the minister's office, if not the prime minister's office, just as an update. Uh, you know, in government terms, it's called an aid memoir or a uh, note for information is, oh, by the way, here's what the immigration department has been doing for the last year. And to sit here and, and try and tell the Canadian people that th- they had no idea this was happening, but now now it's time for a change and we're on top of this file is uh, is quite frankly ludicrous. It also makes me wonder how prepared is this government for the issues that are outstanding in the in the immigration system, even with the reduced numbers of uh, permanent residency spaces announced recently by Minister Miller. This government has an immigration policy now that relies on people who who are going to have expired visas. 1.2 million of them in one year alone. 
voluntarily leaving the country. Now, if you if you came here and want to stay here and build a life here, how many of these 1.2 million people are going to leave? Maybe we're already seeing this in the number of international students who are uh, walking into immigration offices and, and making claims of asylum. They came here as international students, not as mm. uh, refugees or people wanting to claim asylum. They came here as international students. But because of the backlog being what it is, three, four, five years, the moment they if they make a claim, then they have to have a hearing. So they're safe here for at least another, you know, three or four years probably, and then they can appeal. And, and not to mention... The U.S. situation, where you have a president-elect who has promised mass deportations. And we know that there was an increase in people making asylum claims in Canada after the first Trump administration. Are we really getting the, the, the full story, at least from the government, on the, on the many problems with immigration right now? What would you say, Jordan? No, this is all politics. And I was about to say that exact same thing, Rob. The, uh, with the Trump administration coming in and now promising these deportations, what is Justin Trudeau's position going to be? He's always tried to position himself as kind of the, you know, the, the progressive leader now of the world, senior statesman on the, on the left side of things at, uh, at G7, G20. Yeah. In, back in 2016, when Trump first came in, he said those fleeing persecution, Canada is going to welcome you. So how's that going to square with now what they're trying to do and reverse course and what they've done over the last, uh, over the last nine years? Uh, especially in the face of an incoming U.S. administration who, who has promised to do exactly as we were just talking about, um, about uh, mass deportations. So I, like, I think they're just sort of moving day to day, kind of flying by the seat of the pants on this particular issue. Um, they realize they have to do something. Canadians' provinces uh, were demanding uh, that they do something, especially in Quebec, um, which, is, which is the Liberals' um, backyard support. Um, so they, they don't seem to have any type of clear strategy beyond thinking like, okay, well, we have to do something. Um, so there's just, I, I just don't think anything's very well thought out as far as this. I think they're just kind of throwing things out into the wind and seeing what, what happens. Yeah, I want to hear from Neil on this, but it'll have to be after the break. We have to stop here. There is no question Rob won't get answered. Now you know with Rob Snow continues on News Radio. Here with conservative strategist Neil Brody and Jordan Paquette uh, from Blue Sky Strategy Group, I did want to hear from from, from Neil on maybe getting a, a you know a fuller picture of some of the challenges in in the immigration system right now. There could be 1.2 million people with expired status, and the government expects them to leave all of them voluntarily. We have uh, international students now claiming refugee status. Fourteen thousand of them in the fourteen thousand in just the last year. We have the 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 U.S. situation as well, eh, with Donald Trump promising the largest deportation in U.S. history. What, what, what do you think about some of these challenges in the immigration system and how well-equipped this government is to deal with them, given their record, uh, Neil? Uh, well, a couple of things, Rob. Uh, firstly, this is this is not something that's going to be solved overnight. It took uh, nine or ten years to get to, to, get to this position. Uh, I hope it... Hope I hope it doesn't take nine or ten years to fix, but it's going to take years to fix. And uh, and the interesting thing about that is Mr. Trudeau and his government likely won't be around to to see the fixes being done. It's going to take a, a new government a, a year from now okay. or, or sooner. There's going to be an election. Uh, if you believe the polls, which I, I, I they've been around long enough now that I think there'll be a change in government after the next election, and then it becomes their, uh, their problem to fix. I, I don't know how you go through the masses of information uh, that have been uh, uh, ignored by this current Liberal government for the last couple of years on the skyrocketing numbers of, of, of people coming to Canada for studies for a better life, for safe refuge from the uh, countries where, where they, they came from originally. Uh, uh, but it's, it, you know, the question is now not what the Liberal government is going to do to, to fix this, because they they obviously can't fix it. The question now becomes, what is Mr. Polyev going to do? And I don't know that he's come out at all on this topic yet to, to discuss his solutions. Uh, but it's it's just another uh, nail in the coffin of the Trudeau government where people look at this, this Trudeau government that came in with big smiles and bright ideas in 2015. And after nine years, people are wondering what exactly they were, were doing to manage uh, the cookie store while, uh, while they mm-hmm. were... 
uh, running the government. Uh, it, okay. it, it falls us the mind. Let's turn to affordability. Um, the NDP leader, Jagmeet Singh, I thought made an interesting affordability pitch, eliminating sales tax on essentials. Things like home heating, uh, for example, home heating, internet bills, cell phone bills, diapers, children's uh, clothing, prepackaged meals at the grocery store. And then, so I, I thought, I, that's not a bad idea. And then he said, and I'm going to raise taxes on wealthy corporations to pay for it. He calls it an excess profits tax, a windfall tax. The CEOs will pay for it, he said. What do you think of that kind of pitch from Mr. Singh, Neil? Uh, well, Mr. Singh is late to the party, but at least he's arrived to talk about uh, affordability in Canada. Uh, if you'll let me uh, quote a famous uh, politically incorrect political mind from the past, Jim Malone, isn't it just like the NDP to bring a knife to a gunfight? Um, <laughs> this is the type, you know, this is the type of thinking we've come to expect from from Mr. Singh. He's he's a completely inserious political leader. Uh, if he thinks that uh, cutting the GST, I, I assume that's his proposal, cutting the GST for yes. consumers. Cutting goods, the GST, yes. And then increasing corporate taxes on the corporations that provide those goods. Uh, and that tax increase will just be passed straight through into the price of the good that consumers pay. If he thinks this sort of reasoning is going to reduce the cost of things, he's living in the, the NDP fantasy world. Uh, it makes me long for the days when, when Mr. Mulcair was a leader of the federal NDP. Uh, th- th- this sort of thinking is reflected in the polls. Mr. Singh is, uh, you know, looking like he's going to lose seven or eight seats in the next election, if you believe the poll aggregators. Uh, yeah. It was a far cry from the 2011 election when, when Jack Layton won over 100 seats. So, yeah. And isn't that incredible with the Liberals so weak that the NDP is doing that poorly? I mean, isn't that isn't that extraordinary? Okay, let's get a quick comment from Jordan here before we have to stop again. I really want to talk about Randy Boissonneau again today, too. An incredible story about that guy again today in the news. Oh, my God, you won't believe it. Uh, Jordan, go ahead. On the NDP's affordability pitch, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, I, look, I totally agree with Neil here. Uh, he's losing credibility by the day. He says he wants the PPMs run into the PM, but every time he has a chance to bring the government down, he completely just balks at it and, uh, and and wants to protect his own current status in Parliament, um, including and, and interesting on on the GST and home heating. I mean, how many times did he vote and his party vote to raise the carbon tax with with the Liberals? So I mean, it, it's pretty rich for him to come out and, and pitch this now. Interesting, enough, great policy, you know, reducing taxes, and if that's something that uh, that a lot of Canadians can get behind. Uh, but to Neil's point, they're not going to um, if you start overtaxing some of these corporations and CEOs. The increase, the price increases will just go be passed on to the consumer, um, or people will just start moving their headquarters to the to the U.S. under under Donald Trump, where it's uh, where his tax system is going to be much more um, much more easy for uh, for some of these okay. future companies. All right, when we come back, the many trials, tribulations of Randy Boissonneau, still Liberal cabinet minister, the jobs minister, Randy Boissonneau. When we come back. This is News Radio. You have questions. Now you know with Rob Snow has the answers on News Radio. Back with Neil Brody, conservative strategist Jordan Paquette with uh, Blue Sky Strategy Group in uh, Ottawa today. This is a story from the National Post today. I'll just read the lead and leave it at that. The medical supply company, co owned by Employment Minister Randy Boissonneau, shared a post office box with a woman named in arrest in two major drug busts, according to corporate files. Again, uh, that is in the, the National Post today. You can, go, you can go read it for yourself. But what do you think is going to happen, Jordan, to Randy Boissonneau, given his ever-changing story about his own Indigenous identity, the alleged Indigenous ownership of his company? What do you think is ahead from him? Does he get dropped from Cabinet, or does he stick around in Cabinet and he just gets defeated in the next election? What do you think could happen here to Mr. Boissonneau, Jordan? Well, a few things. I think he will get defeated in the next election. Uh, I think it's what the Edmonton Center has, has flipped back and forth, and just given where they are nationally, there's, there's no way he's going to be able to hold on to that seat. The only thing he has going for him is that he's one of the two uh, Liberal MPs from, from Alberta. They want to have representation around the table. But getting back to the original point, this is a this was a poorly managed crisis right from the start. He showed up to the original committee inquiry, was very dismissive of it, said, uh, this is just a distraction, I want to get back to work now. And now he's having to face calls um, – 
about questioning his his indigenous identity. They they submitted bids uh, for for government contracts, saying that uh, that it was an indigenous owned company. Um, back and forth, just trying to get that particular story right. And now these um, these more shady characters that uh, that he seems to have been dealing with in this business. I mean, he went into business with some of these people, but Stephen Anderson, who was found. Uh, who was found in contempt at, uh, at a parliamentary committee as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so it just doesn't sound like he, he kept very good company in this. Sounds like he tried to go out after his, his first uh, elected, uh, elected time in office, tried to make a bunch of money, uh, and just and surrounded himself with a bunch of people that, uh, that he clearly shouldn't have. So I, I don't think he's somebody that should be sitting around the cabinet table right now. Okay. What do you see happening to Randy Boissonneau? Do you think he'll face any consequences for any of this, uh, Neil? Well, let me just start by saying I remember the good old days of $15 orange juices uh, leading to the resignation <laughs> of cabinet ministers. Uh, poor old Bev Oda, one of the kindest, gentlest ladies you'll ever meet. Uh, listen, uh, I, 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 if he's not gone by now, I don't know how they can send him out now because, you know, they've, they've invested so much in protecting him. Uh, I will say, though, however, that, you know, it, it plays into the adage, truth is stranger than fiction. And I hope when Randy Boissonneau, uh loses the next election, that there's still some money left over in the Netflix production budget so that he can sell his story uh, to the same company that brought us Tiger King. <laughs> this, is, this story is outlandish. Outlandish. Yeah, and yeah, like Jordan crazy. said, the, the, the constant drip, drip every week of a new a new little tidbit in Randy Boissonneau's life uh, is 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 not helping him, not helping the government. Uh, you know that their other representative from Alberta was was found during the last election stealing campaign literature from his appoint from his opponents out of people's mailboxes. Like uh, if if any liberal gets elected in uh, in Alberta federally in the next election, I'd be very surprised. Okay. Good to hear from both of you. Great way to start the week. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. <Bye-bye. laughs> Thanks, Rob. Have a good day. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Neil Brody, spent some time in the Harper PMO, longtime conservative strategist. Jordan Piquette, senior consultant. Blue Sky Strategy Group, the talkback, is coming up next. The intersection of taxes and the cost of living will be our topic today on Talkback with your help right after the news on News Radio. It's time to talk back. On Now You Know with Rob Snow. Call now. And have your say. 1-833-668-2577. Welcome to Talk Back. Two hours of debate and discussion on some of the big issues of the day. And today's topic, taxes and the cost of living. With your help, we're going to talk about things like the carbon tax, the GST, the possibility of new wealth taxes, or windfall taxes, or excess profit taxes, and how, if at all, they help with the cost of living. We have a lot of material to work with when it comes to all of these issues today. Let's start with the carbon tax. Prime Minister Trudeau is in Brazil at the G20 meeting. And while there, he took part in a discussion, and one of the topics was the carbon tax. And Mr. Trudeau said that the carbon tax has, quote, become a way of helping with affordability. That's what he said. He said the carbon tax is putting money into the pockets of people who are struggling because they get rebates on the carbon tax. And those rebates are more than people pay in the carbon tax. So let's listen together to what Mr. Trudeau said. This is courtesy of the Canadian press actually has become a way of helping with affordability, of putting more money in the pockets of people who are struggling. Because when we talk about fighting climate change, everyone has the sense that, oh no, big businesses and millionaires are going to find ways around it. And it's always hardworking consumers and ordinary folks that bear the brunt of the changes. And what we've had to do in Canada, what we've successfully done, is change that dynamic so it Our fight against climate change goes hand in hand with affordability. But that's where, as I was talking about earlier, we're facing a level of attacks, of misinformation, of disinformation uh, by people who are saying, no, 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 we have to stop the fight against climate change in Canada so we can put a little more money in your pockets, even though that's exactly the wrong thing for the planet. And it's actually the wrong thing for money in their pockets. And that's a lot of what the next year's election is going to be about in Canada. 
Okay, so you heard him. The fight against climate change goes hand in hand with affordability. And people would under would understand that, but there are attacks and there is misinformation and there is disinformation by people who want to stop the fight against climate change. Okay, so according to Mr. Trudeau, the carbon tax helps fight climate change and it puts more money in your pocket. It's a win-win. And if you believe otherwise, you are falling for misinformation and disinformation. So I'd love to start there. Do you think what Mr. Trudeau is saying is true? Is the carbon tax good for affordability? Because it puts more money into people's pockets because of the rebates they get on the carbon tax. What would you say? Are you better off financially because of the rebates on the carbon tax? Is the carbon tax good for your family's finances? one 833 668 2577 668 2577 Now, keeping with our theme today, taxes and the cost of living. What do you think of this idea? No GST on essentials. No sales tax. No GST on essentials. Whatever the government says are essentials, such as home heating bills, grocery store meals like prepared meals, Internet bills, cell phone bills, diapers, and children's clothing. No GST on those items. No federal goods and services tax. This is a pitch from the federal NDP. No sales tax on essential items. And that's the list of essential items from the NDP leader, Jugmeet Singh, who made this pitch to to Canadians during an event in Toronto last week. He said Canadians are having a hard time making ends meet. They need a break, and this is one way to give them a break. This is what Mr. Singh said. We already made a decision in a lot of areas that are essentials that we don't apply GST. So right now, when you buy groceries, there's not GST applied to that. So that happens right at the till. And so we want to expand that to acknowledge that Canadians are going through a tough time. And our daily essentials shouldn't be where government is nickel and diming people. And so we think about the things that you need. When you go to a grocery store and you buy your... You buy some bread and sandwich meats, uh, that's going to be no tax, no GST. But if you went to the deli at the same grocery store and grabbed a quick snack, a healthy snack there, that would have tax. We want to take it off of that. When uh, we look at some of the essentials, we all need access to the Internet. So cell phone and Internet now is a crucial, vital thing that we need in our lives. We want to take the GST off of that as well. When we look at some of the needs for kids, when we're buying children's clothing or diapers, they still have GST applied to those. We'd remove it from those as well. So this could happen at the point of sale, and it would be removed immediately. No application, no rebate, just a direct removal. Acknowledging that these things are essentials, let's give people a break right now. Let's give people a break right now. So this is part of his affordability pitch. No sales tax on Essentials. Who doesn't want to save the tax? What do you think of that idea? Well, we talked about affordability last week. A number of callers raised this very thing. Some of you thought we shouldn't have to pay tax on utility bills, for example, like a home heating bill. What do you think of this idea? The thing with this idea from the NDP is that there's a part two. Mr. Singh said, whatever money the government loses from not charging sales tax on these essential items, the government would make up for it by having what's known as a windfall tax or a tax on what the government deems to be excess profits at big corporations. This is what um, Mr. Singh said about this. Again, this was last week at an event. He said the CEOs are going to pay for this measure. And we're going to pay for it by bringing in an excess profit tax to make sure those ultra-wealthy and large corporations pay their fair share, and we can use that money to bring down costs for families. We're going to make the CEOs pay for it. Make the CEOs pay for it. So if a company makes too much money, too much profit, the government would have a special tax called an excess profit tax or a windfall tax to help in Mr. Singh's plan, whatever government revenue would be lost from not having the GST on this list of essential items. Love to know what you think about this idea. 
And whether you support the idea of the government having a special tax called a windfall tax or an excess profit tax, company X, like Loblaws, you made too much money this year and we're the government and that excess profit that you made, we're going to tax that. What do you think of that idea? You would get a break on the GST from a list of essential items and some big corporation might get slapped with a new tax to make up for it because the big corporation's making too much money. Do you support this idea, saving the GST on essential items, big corporations being hit with a windfall tax, an excess profit tax, taxes and affordability, carbon taxes, sales taxes, excess profit taxes? Please share your opinion. At one eight three three six six eight twenty five seventy seven one eight three three six six eight twenty five seventy seven. If you've never called before, just mention that to our call screener. We'll make your call a priority. It's talk back. Let's start the week together. You're on News Radio. Have something on your mind you want everyone to know? Call now. Hello. One eight three three six six eight twenty five seventy seven. It's Talk Back on Now You Know with Rob Snow. Taxes and the cost of living are topic of the day. At an event today in Brazil, Mr. Trudeau said the carbon tax not only helps to fight climate change, but it's also a good affordability measure. It puts more money in your pocket because you get more money back because of the rebates on the carbon tax. Asking if you think that's true. Also, the federal NDP says it would take the GST off of essential items like home heating bills, cell phone bills, internet bills, prepared food at the grocery store, diapers, children's clothing. And it says whatever revenue the government loses because of that, it would make up for that by charging big corporations what's known as a windfall tax or a tax on excess profits. What do you think of that idea? Is that a good idea? one 888 Herman in Calgary up first there. Hi, Herman. What's your opinion, Herman? Well, I would like to talk about the carbon tax, but I'm reminded of uh, Ronald Reagan on both your topics today when Ronald Reagan said the biggest lie a government will ever tell you is I'm with the government and I'm here to help. Okay, yeah. Look, the carbon tax is sort of a red red herring. If you're going to boost the cost of energy up, it impacts absolutely everything. You know, in the past, people said it's a tax on everything. On the face of it, some people may feel that they are being enriched by the checks that the government sends every month. Who doesn't like getting a check? But in right. truth, you're actually losing out on economic growth. So maybe that raise that you were hoping for this year isn't going to come through because these are mm-hmm. all related terms. And whether it's a carbon tax or if we go to Mr. Singh's brilliant idea to have a windfall tax or something like that, well, you know, that affects the dividends that corporations pay out to their shareholders, predominantly pensioners. And really the issue is it sets up another fight between public sector employees and private sector employees because at some level the government is on the hook for those public sector uh, sector employees' uh, pension plans. And let's be honest, we're financing things through debt right now. This is a huge intergenerational tax burden that I think a lot of people aren't really thinking about. All right, Herman, interesting points all around and a a good start to talk back today uh, to Chris in uh, Woodstock. Hi, Chris. Yeah, when I was a little kid back in the late 50s and early 60s, there was no tax on the essentials. And I'm not talking diapers and Internet and stuff. I'm talking about home heating, electricity and water, those three things. And I think uh, a lot of food items were non-taxed. So those are the essentials. Forget about diapers and, and the Internet. The Internet can be taken care of as far as competition goes. We can lower our Internet not by taking the tax off, but by giving more competition like they do in the U.S. So as far as making up the HST or GST on all the other things, on the essentials, the three I mentioned, the three important ones, uh, heating, electricity, water, uh, that can be uh, made back by government waste. They're taking, uh, sorry, um, uh, less government and, and less waste. Trudeau is right, right, right off right. the market. So if it costs $5 yeah. billion, we're, we're you sh- you're saying you should be able to find $5 billion worth of efficiency somewhere in the federal government somewhere more to make than up that. for it. More, way more, more than, than that. that. Sure. Way, okay. Way okay. More, okay. more than okay. that. Okay. So you know where I'm going with this. So government can take care of that part. Those three essentials, forget about the internet, we can take care of that with competition. Okay. 
What do you think about this idea? Because this is kind of part two of his idea. This would cost $5 billion, but we're going to make up for it by charging big corporations a, a tax on any excess profit that they make. No, what we, do you we, think we, about that? We, we, don't, we don't have to do that with the big corporations. Just leave them alone. So you're saying that uh, that would be basically be saying the government that, oh, we can keep our waste as long as we charge big corporations more tax. Take it off the wasteful way the government is doing business here in Canada in the past 40, 50 years. All right. Thank you for your call today, Uh, Chris in Woodstock. uh, We'll uh, stop here because we want to make sure that we get our traffic reports on the air, especially for our friends in Calgary today where it's uh, quite snowy and slippery there. Winter has arrived and it's in full swing, it would seem, early in Calgary today. So we're going to stop here and we'll be right back on the phones when we come back. It's Talk Back here on 1-833-668-2577. Have something on your mind you want everyone to know? Call now. Hello. 1-833-668-2577. It's Talk Back on Now You Know with Rob Snow. And the cost of living today. Mr. Trudeau says the carbon tax is a good affordability measure, not just an environmental measure, a good affordability measure because you make more money back than you pay in carbon tax because of his rebates. I'd love your thoughts on that. The NDP says, we will take the GST off essential items like home heating bills, for example. Whatever revenue we lose from that, we would make up for it by charging big corporations a tax on any excess profits they make. I'd love your take on that. Tim in Dartmouth, thanks for calling. Tim, what's your opinion here, Tim, today? Well, I paid about $1,500 in uh, carbon tax. I got back less than five hundred. Yeah, I'm really far ahead. Now, as for uh, Jughead, really, what? first of all, he never explained what excess profit is. I mean, most companies, with very few, most of the shareholders are public pensions, private pensions, RRFTs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So he's going to take uh, money out of pensioners' mouths now? You know, this guy... As usual, with the left, all these big ideas and not a clue on how anything is being paid for. Okay. Okay. Well, what they they have done this in other countries, sir. They have an excess profit tax. For example, uh, the conservative government, when when, the Tories, when they were in power in the UK, they brought in an excess profit tax on the big oil companies in in the UK. Started at 25% on whatever the government deemed to be an excess profits. Raise billions of dollars. And, and, and what did the, the government revenue. do with it? Because I don't see Eng- England in any great shakes right now. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You, know, you want? Well, I you, can tell you what you the government cut. did with it. They started it at twenty five percent, and then they raised it to thirty five percent, and now they've raised it again to thirty eight percent. I think. Yeah. Is the and what did it do? Absolutely tax. nothing. Right. Okay. Okay. You know, okay. Okay. As I said. You got a plan, right. you know. It's like here in uh, Nova Scotia. Well, free uh, bridge fare, free transit. There's no such thing as free. We okay. pay for it through our taxes. People have got to get sure. that in their heads. No such thing as free. Okay. And this is just what, uh, this is a it, what is it? Okay. A three, you know, three card Monty is all they're playing. Three card Monty. Okay. Okay. They're going to get you one way or another. Um, but what do you think about the idea that, of paying GST on so-called essentials, whether it's a home heating bill or a cell phone bill or an internet bill or diapers or whatever? What do you think? Take the well, GST off of that stuff. I mean, if it, diapers, yeah, I can see that. Okay. Home heating, while well, you get rid of the carbon tax, GST right. doesn't really okay. matter. You know, again, okay. you know, bread and circuses. Smoke and mirrors. Smoke and mirrors. Okay, That's thank you, Tim. Says. Gotcha. Smoke and mirrors, he says. Kyle in the list all. Kyle. Hi there, Kyle. What's your opinion here, Kyle? Well, you know what? I, what? I guess I'm kind of mixed up. I don't like paying the carbon tax. I looked at it. I looked at my bill. Uh, I got my bill, actually, a couple of days ago, and it said I spent $26 on uh, heating fuel, and, I spilled tw- and $12 of that is on the carbon tax. Now, if they're going to raise the carbon tax in April... Does that mean that the people that are getting these rebates, are they going to get more out of the rebate now because they're, they're raising the, the carbon tax, or are they going to stay the same rebate? 
and the, no, the rebate goes up. The rebate goes the rebate up as the carbon more. tax okay. goes up. Yeah. Okay, yeah. but I mean, like, I don't mind paying some taxes, but I don't like paying taxes when we're spending more and more, we're putting our country more and more in debt. Like, the more taxes we have, the more debt we're going to be. I don't like that. Some of the windfall things I think I agree on. I mean, I, I okay. talked to um, the lady that does the, the, the screening for the calls there, and I told her, I said, well, why not? feminine hygiene products. Add that as a, not, as a thing that you should be taxing. I think that's a big, important thing. Um, so there's, there's certain mm. things I don't mind, but I don't mind, like, you know, I'm glad that I pay taxes for health care and, and things like that. You know, when, you know, is, is it perfect? No, but I'm glad that I could go to the, you know, if anything happens, I could go, you know, go to the hospital and not worry about anything, right? But the cost of living right now is, 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 is astronomical, and I just don't like when they keep saying they're going to do this and they're going to do that, and then they just keep sent and blowing money um, out the wazoo to, you know, to things that, you know, that are putting this country more in debt, but they're going to keep saying that, oh, we're going to do this and we're going to die. I just don't like it there, Rob. All right, Kyle, thank you for your call. Yep. We will stop yep. here. Have something on your mind you want everyone to know? Call now. Hello. 1-833-668-2577. It's Talk Back on Now You Know with Rob Snow. Talking about taxes and the cost of living. So Mr. Trudeau is in Brazil for the G20. He's at an event hosted by an anti-poverty group. And he says that the carbon tax is a good affordability measure. It puts money in your pocket and it helps you with the cost of living. This is what Mr. Trudeau said. Actually has become a way of helping with affordability, of putting more money in the pockets of people who are struggling. Because when we talk about fighting climate change, everyone has the sense that, oh no, big businesses and millionaires are going to find ways around it. And it's always hardworking consumers and ordinary folks that bear the brunt of the changes. And what we've had to do in Canada, what we've successfully done, is change that dynamic so it our fight against climate change goes hand in hand with affordability. But that's where goes I was hand talking in hand about with earlier. affordability. Thank you, David. That's good. Yeah. Goes hand in hand with affordability. Okay. They found a way around it. Do you think that's true? Is the carbon tax and the rebates on the carbon tax, are they helping you with affordability? That's what it boils down to today. one 668 Meantime, you have the NDP saying, Elect us, we'll take the GST off essential items like home heating bills, cell phone bills, internet bills, prepared food at the grocery store, diapers and children's clothing, and whatever money we lose, the government loses because of that. We're going to make up for that by charging big corporations what's known as a windfall tax or a tax on excess profits. So if a company makes too much money in Canada, according to the government, that company would have to pay a special tax. What do you think of that idea? In the name of affordability, one 2577 Lots of lines available there, folks. Adam in uh, Halifax, thanks for waiting. Adam, you're on the air. Go ahead, Adam. What do you think? Hey, how you doing today? Good, Adam. Thanks for calling. What's your opinion here? Um, well, I just want to make a comment on uh, Jagmeet Singh's idea there. Um, it's, yep. I mean, from it, it seems like, I mean, it's not an original idea. It's been floated around for decades now to tax the rich. Um, I know there's a few few places around the world that have kind of implemented it, and it, uh, it, it doesn't seem to work. Um, from what I've, what I've seen it, it's done is you tax large corporations like Loblaws, they're, they're just going to add, I mean, they're not going to say, okay, fine, we'll just lose money. They're just going to add it onto their product. So we end up paying it anyway. Um, so it does that. It also disincentivizes new companies from starting. You know, it's something that they look at and say, where's a friendly place to start a business? Oh, maybe not Canada because, you know, they've got this tax that we're going to get dinged with if we start doing really well. And it also makes companies leave because they think, why why would I stay here and get this tax? Okay. Because we're being successful. It's, you know, people leave. And I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the 1% in most Western countries already pay something between what I've you know, for roughly between 80 or 90 percent of all the taxes, wherever, you know, depending on what region you're in. But they, I mean, they already pay a buttload of taxes and we get a lot of our pensions from them. And I, I just don't feel like they should be. I don't know. I, I, I don't. I, to me, it seems like more of a punishment okay. and it's just not an original idea. OK, 
Okay. What do you think, uh, generally speaking, about taking the sales tax off essentials? Like, for example, last week we were talking about this. What would make life more affordable? A number of people said, well, why am I paying a tax on a bill to heat my home, for example? Why do I have to pay a tax on that? Some people like that idea. What do you think? I, I fully agree with that. No, I fully agree with okay. that. Um, yeah, no, I totally support that. Yeah, for sure. But where they get the money to make that up, definitely not by taxing corporations. So that's the biggest thing. They're just going to add it onto their product. We're going to pay it anyway. Okay. So so finally, um, so you are in, uh, you're in Nova Scotia. So a family of four in Nova Scotia gets, throughout the year, in carbon tax rebates, about $824. That's for a family of four, for the whole year, $824. Because you have this carve-out on on home heating fuel already. Um, Mr. Trudeau says you're better off because of those rebates. It's a good affordability measure. What's that? Probably about $70 a month. So maybe, you know, somewhere between $15 and $20 a week. That's not affecting anybody. No. Especially a family no. of four. That's not doing anything. Eight hundred and twenty four dollars. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's not doing much. Not doing much. Okay. Thank you, Adam. Good to hear from you, sir. Appreciate the call. To uh Mike also in Halifax today. Mike, you're on the air. Go ahead. What's your opinion here, Mike? Hello, Mike. Oh, I think we lost Mike. Let's go to uh Bernie don't, in Mississauga. Don't lose me. Oh hi hi Mike. You there? I got you, Mike. Yes, Mike, go ahead. Okay. Listen, as far as the uh, the taxes and stuff go, um, we might as well just leave them alone because everything, with the exception of the carbon tax, I think we can get rid of that one because uh, Canada really is doing pretty good as far as their, you know, all their recycling programs and everything. I think we're doing, you know, like the statistics show, we're pretty low in the global scheme of things um but uh everything we talk about taxes and everything that has been talked about taxes if we remove this one we're going to get things somewhere else if we so i believe the solution is we need more money and when i say we need more money i'm basically speaking for myself who you and i've discussed this before what i'm living on and uh you know, I don't need a hundred dollars every three months um, to help me out. What I need is a steady uh, kind of income that lets me live life. Right now, I'm basically in survival mode, and that's. And I know a lot of seniors that are in that same position. It's just a matter of, you know, how do how do I do this, and how do I make it work just to get by. And it's, right, right. it's not really living, Rob. It's it's really not. It, like I said, it just feels more like I'm surviving until my time's up. Like, and it's and it sucks. It really does. Okay. Um, okay. I think, you hang in and there. I know there's a lot of people that collect the uh, CPP and the old age. I think there's a formula in there where you can look at, and this is all computerized. They've got all the statistics where you can look at people like myself, that are being asked to live on $1,600 a month. And I'm not in any kind of uh, housing or anything else, so I pay for everything like everybody else. And, uh, you know, uh, if they looked at my screen and said, well, you know, if this guy had 2500 a month or 3000 a month, I mean, it's still not me going away on a sunny vacation once a year, but... You know, at least my life's a little bit uh, a little bit sunnier anyway. All right. All right. You hang in there, Mike. It's good to hear from you again. Yeah. Nice right, to buddy. hear your voice. Take care. Yeah. 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 Good to hear from you. All right. Uh, we'll stop there. We'll go to Bernie and Mississauga. Kevin in Calgary and a line for you as well. Have something on your mind you want everyone to know? Call now. Hello. 1-833-668-2577. It's Talk Back on Now You Know with Rob Snow. Well, at the G20 meeting, Mr. Trudeau said the carbon tax not only helps fight climate change, but it's also good for your wallet. It's a good affordability measure. Puts more money back into your pocket. What do you think about that claim from Mr. Trudeau? The NDP is promising to take the GST off essential items like home heating bills, internet bills, cell phones, children's clothing, 
diapers and whatever revenue the government loses out on because of that, they'd make up for it by charging big corporations what's known as a tax on excess profits or a windfall tax. What do you think? What do you think of that pitch, that affordability pitch on taxes from the NDP? One eight three three six six eight twenty five seventy seven. Bernie in Mississauga. Hello, Bernie. Hi, Rob. How you doing? Good, Bernie. Good to hear from That's you. Good. What do you think? I'm, I'm glad Mr. Singh came out with this proposal. I'd like to see them get the NDP a majority of government across the country to right. see if he'd put in some of these measures because, uh, as we all know, the cream rises to the top, and a lot of the cream over the last 20, 30 years has risen to the top, and the people have been shortchanged at the bottom. So it's time to siphon some of that cream off. And as far as tax and profitable corporations, if their profits are excessive or anything like that, the perfect good idea would be. Yeah, and why do you say that? Uh, a number of people are worried about what it would do to the economy or what it would do to pension plans and things well, like that. Well, they yeah. said that there were free trade. Bob Waite tried to tell them that all the jobs would leave Ontario to manufacture, and they got at the manufacturing section and now went to the southern states for cheap wages and everything cheap working conditions and everything. So, I mean, that that's a bogus argument. That Then people will make profits wherever they're at, and uh, they won't leave a place where it's a secure, good, well-run country uh, with resources and everything like that. Wherever there's money, they'll be there to make it. Like I said, the cream rides to the top. It's time to take some of that cream and put it down to the ordinary people. All right, Bernie. Thanks for the call. Okay, bye. Yeah. bye. Okay, yeah, yeah. You see, I'm, I'm not totally opposed to this first part that the NDP is saying, which is unusual for me to say. Let's take the GSE off essentials, like like home heating bills or internet bills or cell phone bills. I pay all those bills. I'd love to save the GST on on items like that. It's the second part I'm I'm not too fond of charging big corporations windfall taxes or excess profit tax. How do you determine that a company is making too much money? So much money they have to pay a special tax. Like when do you hit that that threshold? One eight three three six six eight twenty five seventy seven. Um from Bernie to Kevin in uh, snowy, wintry Calgary today. Hello, Kevin. Hey, how are you doing? Uh, I'm you good, Kevin. Call. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the young lady that uh, answered the phone, I says, is this Rob Snow? She goes, no, it's not. Do I sound like Rob Snow? <laughs> 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 I'm trying to figure out if I had the right phone number. Yeah, you have it. Yes, here. yes, you do. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's not that snowy here. I'm, I'm only sitting in two inches of snow here, so anyhow. Okay, all right. Well. Um, this GSP, Welcome to it. How many people have actually um, uh, platformed that they would get rid of it and it's still here? So that's not going away. So now we got it's the carbon tax. We're all okay. platforming against getting rid of the carbon tax. Well, you know what? I don't think that's going away either. They may rebrand it, but it's hmm. never going to go away. Once we get a tax, it stays because the go- the government makes all the money. Okay. I love coming to your show because I always get educated. Um, educate me some more, sir. That's my opinion. Okay. No, listen, before you run, though, Kevin, before okay. you run, I mean, you hear Polyev, I'm going to ax the tax. You don't believe that he's going to ax the tax? Well, he'll ax the tax in, in, in name, but he'll keep that somewhere else. Like, okay. We, we'll never get away from something that makes the government money. We, we just can't run from it because how many people have said we'd get rid of the GST, right? Well, I know Mr. Kretchen said we get rid of the GST. And many more after him. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, Kevin. Good to hear from you. Two inches of snow down, he says, in Calgary today. Uh, it's only a matter of time, I guess. Um, we better stop here. And then we'll get to Eric out in uh, Coal Harbor, Nova Scotia. And we'll go back to Calgary and talk to Brian. And Kathy's in Woodstock today. All your calls are just ahead, folks. Just hang on. Uh, but we'll stop. It's talk back. We're talking taxes and affordability today. One eight three three six six eight twenty five seventy seven. This is News Radio. Have something on your mind you want everyone to know? Call now. Hello. One eight three three six six eight twenty five seventy seven. It's talk back on now. You know with Rob Snow. The carbon tax is a good affordability measure. Puts more money in your wallet. What do you think of that? The NDP says we would take the GST off essential items like home heating bills 
And any money that the government loses because of that will just have a special tax on big corporations if they make too much money in Canada. A windfall tax, that's called. What do you think about that idea? Eric in Coal Harbor. Hi, Eric. Hey, how you doing, Rob? I'm good, Eric. Good to hear from you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, and tell the lad in Calgary to move down to the Miami of the North here in Coal Harbor. And maybe you won't suffer winter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds a Anyways, uh, I'm going to make this very quick so I don't invoke your pricey powers. Number one is with a windfall tax, I agree with you, that's garbage, because if a business is successful and making a lot of money, chances are they're going to expand and therefore provide more employment when more people are working. In my view, there's more taxes being paid. Okay. Uh, secondly, when it comes to CO2, uh, I'm going to say this very quickly. Back in, uh, back in the 1500s, there was something called the Little Ice Age. The parts per million were at 275. Now, according to people that know what they're talking about, which isn't me, they say that in order for CO2, the effective temperature by one degree, it has to double. It hasn't doubled yet. The big problem we're facing in this interglacial uh, warming period that we're in, if the north is where the ice is melting and the tundra and the permafrost goes, we're in big trouble. So according to these people, CO2 isn't the problem. But they say it is Michael Schellenberger in his book, Apocalypse Never, he, yeah. he said that... Uh, the, yeah, that's kind of off the topic. What I want to get at is, you know how they set it up? Well, okay, here's the carbon the tax, tax and here's the rebate the on the carbon tax. But I'm just, I just want to put oh. the Mr. Trudeau's claim oh, okay. to the test okay. here that okay. you're better I'm off because to... you pay the carbon tax, you know? No, affordability. Not because it, it's not what I was trying to point out, Rob, was it uh, doesn't achieve anything. Doesn't uh, achieve anything. You know, uh, and uh, it, because of the reasons I just stated. Uh, okay. It'd be better if we had an infrastructure tax to handle the atmospheric rivers that we're having. And in the last example, New York had a big flood there a few months ago, and it was uh, their infrastructure right. only can handle 174 yeah. inches. It comes down. The rain's going to come down now at around three, uh, three, you know, 324 inches per hour. We got to improve our in, uh, infrastructure because we yeah, more resilient in infrastructure. A okay. Gotcha, Eric. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Okay, Brian in uh, Calgary. Brian. Hi there, Brian. Yeah, thanks, Rob, for taking my call. Um, You're welcome. First first and foremost, the windfall tax, like a few other people have said, is garbage. The other okay. thing that people don't realize about this is if you tax corporations on a windfall tax, you're essentially taxing everybody who has RRSPs and who has, who has share, shares in mutual funds because, like myself, as an example... I mean, most of my money, most of my retirement money is invested, and uh, I rely on those companies to be able to make profits so that they can pay dividends, so that my RSPs continue to grow. So this so-called windfall tax would actually be taxing uh, companies that are successful that would be paying paying us our our retire you know many of us our retirement money. Right. right. Um, as far as the GST become, or the um, carbon tax making life more affordable, um, yes. I've done the math. Um, my wife and I get about eight. We're in Alberta, so we get around eight hundred and eight hundred and fifty a year, I think it is. Okay. And uh, I'm probably because I I use my vehicle a lot for business. I'm probably spending eighteen hundred dollars a year on fuel, and then any everything else. I would say I'm net. I'm probably paying about a thousand more than what I'm getting back, and I'm in the right. I'm in the middle income bracket, say fifty to seventy k. You know. Okay. 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 So, so I, this, I don't know this where idea they get that the it's a good affordability from. measure. It puts more money in your wallet because of the rebates. You're not buying that. that no. Okay. No. Not at all. All right. Okay. What do you think? Very quickly, uh, maybe just a yes or no taking the GST off essential items like your home heating bill, for example. Do you like that idea? I like that idea, and uh, but there's got to be different ways to pay for it than, than what the NDP right. is talking okay. about. Gotcha. Fair enough, sir. Thank you. Good end of the hour. That's our number one in the books. It's time to talk back. On Now You Know with Rob Snow. Call now. And have your say. 1-833-668-2577. 
The cost of living is again the issue and taxes and how they impact the, the cost of living and affordability. That's what we'll be, we've been taking calls on. So let me kind of reset the topic for you for our new listeners, okay? Mr. Trudeau's at the G20. He's at an event uh, being hosted by an anti-poverty group and he's asked about the carbon tax in Canada. And he says it's good for fighting climate change, but he added... It's also good for affordability because you get more money back because of the rebates on on the carbon tax. Let's again listen to what Mr. Trudeau said about the carbon tax. Go ahead. Actually David. has become a way of helping with affordability, of putting more money in the pockets of people who are struggling. Because when we talk about fighting climate change, everyone has the sense that, oh, no, big businesses and millionaires are going to find ways around it. And it's always hardworking consumers and ordinary folks that bear the brunt of the changes. And what we've had to do in Canada, what we've successfully done, is change that dynamic so our fight against climate change goes hand in hand with affordability. But that's where, as I was talking about earlier... That's good, Dan. That's good, Dan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've successfully done it, he says, so that climate change goes hand in hand with affordability. Again, all tied back to the rebates and Mr. Trudeau's claim... You're better off because of the rebates. So you get money in your pocket, he said. Now to the NDP. The NDP last week, uh, leader Jagmeet Singh was at an event in Toronto at the Canadian Club in Toronto. I will take the GST off essential items. You shouldn't have to pay GST on things like home heating bills, cell phone bills, internet bills, prepare foods in the grocery store, diapers, and children's clothing. Let's uh, play that. David, go ahead. We Mr. already Singh made a decision. Week in a lot of areas that are essentials that we don't apply GST. So right now, when you buy groceries, there's not GST applied to that. So that happens right at the till. And so we want to expand that to acknowledge that Canadians are going through a tough time. And our daily essentials shouldn't be where government is nickel and diming people. And so we think about the things that you need. When you go to a grocery store and you buy your, you buy some bread and sandwich meats, uh, that's going to be no tax, no GST. But if you went to the deli at the same grocery store and grabbed a quick snack, a healthy snack there, that would have tax. We want to take it off of that. Okay. When uh, we look at some of the essentials, we all need access to the internet. So cell phone and internet now is a crucial, vital thing that we need in our lives. We want to take the GST off of that as well. When we look at some of the needs for our kids, when we're buying children's clothing or diapers, they still have GST applied to those. We'd remove it from those as well. So this could happen at the point of sale, and it would be removed immediately. No application, no rebate, just a direct removal. Acknowledging that these things are essentials, let's give people a break right now. Okay. So what about the revenue the government would lose because of that, the estimate about $5 billion a year? Well, Mr. Singh said, I'd make up for that by charging big corporations what's known as a windfall tax. The CEOs, he said, would pay for it. Let's listen to that. And we're going to pay for it by bringing in an excess profit tax to make sure those ultra-wealthy and large corporations pay their fair share. And we can use that money to bring down costs for families. We're going to make the CEOs pay for it. Right. Okay. So an excess profit tax been done in other countries. He wants to bring one here. If a company makes too much money in Canada, well, that company has to pay a special tax. I want to know what you think of these ideas and claims from political leaders in Canada. one 866 2577 one 866 2577 To Kathy in Woodstock. Hi, Kathy. Well, good afternoon. Hi, Kathy. I'm still chuckling over the clip from Jag Meek Singh there. CEOs in big business always find a way to protect their profits. Okay. I've lived a long time, seen it for decades. I can't see how you're going to stop that. He talks about removing tax from essential everyday things. If you live long enough, some of those things weren't taxed back in the day. I think before we had the GST, the harmonized sales tax and all of that, it was just a provincial tax. And I do recall that in Ontario, the provincial sales tax was removed from essential things that you needed in a home. Now, back then, it wasn't internet it was, or cell phone. It was hydro, heat, services, plumbing, furna- um, furnace repair, that sort of thing. There was no okay. provincial tax on that back then. Then they put it okay. back on again. Okay. Um, so that sort of addresses that. 
when it comes to the GS or the HS, the carbon tax rebate, yes. Trudeau was right. Some people profit from it, but some don't. And a case in point, I have a friend who has a home similar in age and size to mine. Um, she has a son that lives with her, so each one gets a carbon tax rebate because he has a separate um, home in the basement. One furnace, one heating bill, which she pays, and she's on natural gas. They each get a um, carbon tax rebate when I do, but I live alone, and I have to use propane, which is much more expensive than natural uh-huh. gas. So at the end of the day, I'm sitting here with my last propane bill. I have to pay for the commodity itself. The yes. carbon tax was $123. The uh-huh. HST was $109. Uh-huh. My total heating bill was $954. Oh, my gosh. Now, I don't know how long this will last me. It depends if we keep going with mild weather, you do not use as much propane. But sure. if it gets cold winter weather, I, will, I usually spend $3,000 or more a year to heat this home with propane, and I have no other choice. So the carbon tax that I get is a bit more than the 123, but I don't get enough of them to cover all the top-ups that I have. Luckily, I'm a senior. I do not drive much, so I'm not getting hit with the carbon tax on the fuel that I put into my vehicle. I've come to the conclusion the whole carbon tax thing depends upon your personal activities. But the one thing that really irked me in the spring when they redid this whole thing, rural people get more because we don't have the choices on how we heat our homes. And for me, heating a home is the big one. For right, other and people, you don't have the same access to a public transit system either. There's nothing. Right? No, right. no, yeah, no, you don't course. have any choice. Yeah. And yeah. the only thing yeah. there is, oh, and out here, oil, a lot of house insurance companies do not like oil heat in homes. That's another problem that, that's happening there. Okay. So it, it goes on and on. But going back to a senior who can't afford this, um, what I know is if you are two sen- like a couple as seniors getting pension, living together, you can get by because you've got two pensions a month. But as soon as one of those passes on and there's only one left, the whole financial situation changes. Something oh, to remember. Okay. okay. Thank you. Wow. Really insightful. Very informative. Thank you, Kathy in Woodstock. Okay, hour number two of Talk Back is underway. We love to get your take on these tax-related issues, all related to the, the cost of living and affordability today. Have something on your mind you want everyone to know? Call now. Hello. 1-833-668-2577. It's Talk Back on Now You Know with Rob Snow. Taxes and... Affordability. Mr. Trudeau said today at the G20 that the carbon tax, not only is it a great measure to fight climate change, it's also a very successful affordability measure because you get more money back than you pay because of the rebates that go out quarterly. Now, as well, the NDP is saying we would take the GST off essential items, home heating bills, for example, Diapers, another example, internet bills. What do you think of that idea? It says whatever revenue the government loses because of that will have an excess profits tax, also known as a windfall tax. What do you think of that idea? One eight three three six six eight twenty five seventy seven. Darren in Waterloo today. Hello, Darren. Hey. <laughs> okay. Hi, About Darren. Twenty five years ago, I was an accountant in a, one of the big firms, and okay. I remember the big. And there was a big NDP push. Make the corporations pay their deferred taxes. Deferred taxes are something that show up on the balance sheet. They're just a, a timing difference between what the tax rules are and what the accounting rules are. It's not like a pile of money somewhere. So the NDP has this overriding idea, you just take more pie. What they don't understand is the pie moves. If they ever came anywhere close to being in power, oh my God, the exodus of companies. So. They're just unrealistic. The only difference in the NDP and the Liberals, I think the NDP really believes what they're saying, and I think the Liberals know that they're, you know, pulling games most of the time. Like the carbon tax. Okay. What, what, what about all the admin? Well, I'd like to see how much does it cost to administer it? it there's no way. It doesn't make any sense. It well, it's been reported it, it costs $200 million a year to administer it, if you want to know a figure that's been in the news. I mean, it's $200 million okay. a year. Yeah. Okay. 
That's yeah. fair enough. That that that's a lot to to take money and give more money back. Why don't you just give the money in the first place? It, it doesn't make any sense. But anyway, NDP okay. off the off the mark as usual. They just they just don't. They're not based in reality. Like not that, based that in that reality. Concept of excess excess profits. What if in their mind they, they don't want the companies making anything? So that's a hundred percent. They'd like to see the companies make no money. But like okay. I said, more pie. The pie moves. It doesn't work. Okay. But anyway. What do you think about the idea of uh, taking the GST off essentials, like a home heating bill well, or an internet bill? Or I mean, something? yeah, that, yeah. But like, even the NDP realizes you have to balance that with some kind of take back somewhere else, right? And th- right. I mean, they, they, they were proposing that, which of course is going to grab. Who who's going to disagree with losing a bit of HST on something? But not me. Countered with <laughs> the excess profits, you know. The, idea notion it, it's not gonna not gonna fly but i mean you think people are no further ahead then no i how about this they say we are going to do an in-depth analysis and we're going to reduce waste and because we're going to reduce waste we'll take it we'll, we'll take the gst off essential i'd love that how would you do that okay. there's, there's okay. tons you know what a what a novel idea do a spending review value for money okay darren <laughs> thank you okay. thank you darren thank you. great call thank you so much uh in calgary gary is in calgary hi gary hi rob how are you today i'm good gary great to hear from you today what's your opinion uh, um, with the carbon tax with our yes. municipal and provincial governments um they all have buildings that they need to heat they yes. all have fleets of vehicles that they got to gas up Yes, they, they don't do. get a rebate. So they don't my, get a rebate. Okay. No, my municipal taxes go up to cover this. My provincial taxes go up to cover this, and I don't get a rebate on that. So right. I just to me okay. it's more money like money out. Trudeau says we're all better off. Well, how can I be off if my taxes are going up in my city and my province to cover his carbon tax? Okay, well, he's saying, look, uh, Gary, whatever you're paying on your gas and your home heating fuel and your food and whatever, here's the fact. A family of four every three months is getting a check from the federal government of $450. We are sending, this is what he was, we're sending you $1,800 for the whole year. So whatever your excess costs are that are related to the carbon tax, this $1,800 more than makes up for it, and that's what makes it a good affordability measure. That's what he would say to you, Gary. Oh, oh I think he's out there somewhere filling up a crock or something. Uh, okay. It, it, doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense. And then it doesn't make any the, sense, okay. The GST that we pay on, we already pay that, let's say, on gas. And yes. We get the car tax on top of that, so the GST goes up because uh, it's the carbon the gst follows a carbon tax so we're not getting i'm not getting a rebate on my car uh, my gst so i don't think i'm i'm falling behind farther and farther and i'm, okay. a, I'm, right. a, I'm, a, I'm a pensioner and it's not working for me okay thank you for your call gary great to hear from you bye-bye have something on your mind you want everyone to know? Call now. Hello. 1-833-668-2577. It's Talk Back on Now You Know with Rob Snow. Affordability and taxes. Now, the federal NDP says we would take the GST off essential items. Essential items being things like home heating bills, cell phone bills, internet bills. Diapers, children's clothing, prepared meals at the grocery store, and whatever revenue the government loses because of that, we're going to go after the big corporations. We're going to slap them with what's known as a windfall tax or a tax on excess profits. So if a company makes too much money in Canada, we're going to go after them, make them pay a special tax. What do you think of that idea? And Mr. Trudeau today at the G20 said the carbon tax not only helps fight climate change, it's great for affordability. It's been a successful affordability measure because you get more money back than you than you pay in carbon tax because the government sends you a rebate every quarter. Do you think that's true? one 2577 A few lines available there. Uh, ben in Waterloo, you're up next, Ben. Hi there, Ben. You're on the air. Hey, how's, hey, how's it going? It's great, Hello? Ben. Thanks yep. for calling. Excellent. Uh, I wouldn't listen to either party uh, with Trudeau 
taxes and rebates is just smoke and mirrors. Anytime I get a rebate check from the government, I just toss it to the giant black hole of debt and laugh. Um, it's, it's really pathetic, and I don't <laughs> see how he could say that straight face. Um, and then okay. with the NDP, you know, it's like, it, that sounds good initially, but you're just moving one tax to another. Um, you know, if you, if you start introducing more corporate taxes, eventually that trickles down, start to use that phrase, but that comes down to the consumer anyways. Uh, what we need are just simply less taxes, less government. And how about an end to the corporate subsidies? The billions, is it, I'm sorry, the billions or millions, I don't even remember, you know, towards the Volkswagen and all these other different companies. Oh, uh, that's uh, tens of billions, actually. Yeah, Tens yeah. of billions, thank you. So, I mean, <laughs> I'm just crushed. I, I, I run a small business, entrepreneur, crushed it like oh, so much debt. And, and it's just, it, it kind of makes me angry to listen to both parties. It, it, it's just nonsense. Like, so we just have too much government. Less taxes across the board, please, is what I'd like. Okay. So yeah. you you know, you're in business for yourself, you're an entrepreneur and you say you're being you're being crushed, okay? What is crushing well, I you? I mean, it's it's ever since the pandemic, like it's it's been it's been hard to come back. So yeah. I don't want to get into that too much, but it's just I see. listening to I see. like you I don't want to get I've into it. A, okay. Yeah. I've been enough. a liberal for a long time, but the the older I get and the more the more I see, it's like, you know what? We need to just take things back a few steps because I can't prove that there's a ton of waste, but when I hear about the subsidies and then I look at the taxes I'm paying, forget it. Like it's ridiculous. Right. What, but what do you think about this idea? I, I just want to revisit this because this is something a lot of people brought up uh, last week when we were talking about affordability. Yeah. Why should Canadians pay the GST on something like a home heating bill, for example, or a utility bill, for example, they don't feel well, that's right. What do you think? You know, I, I agree. And the, I, there was a lady who was on just previously who mentioned she remembered a time where there wasn't taxes on certain things. Well, there was a time where we didn't even have income tax. Like you look back over the last 50 years, 70 years, it sounds like a long time, but it isn't. And I'm sure you could graph it where, okay, let's look at medium income versus everything else. Uh, I think it's getting to a breaking point. Um, you know, a, a lot getting on to that a breaking point. subject, okay. though, uh, I think it was Polyev who mentioned taking the GST off of home sales. <laughs> now, I guess I'm not the smartest person. I didn't know there was GST on home sales. Well, that's neither good or service. That's a house. Like, the, things like that where it's like, why... Yeah. We need to ask that question about taxes. It's not just, okay, well, we'll take, you know, you'll save 13% on, you know, a few. Okay, we got to go. Got to go. Got to go. Got to go. Right at a time. I really thank you for your call, though. Ben in Waterloo. Have something on your mind you want everyone to know? Call now. Hello. 1-833-668-2577. It's Talk Back on Now You Know with Rob Snow. We've been talking about the cost of living and we've been talking about taxes and politicians have been talking about taxes and the cost of living. For example, Mr. Trudeau says the carbon tax makes life more affordable because of the rebates that the government sends you every three months. The federal NDP says elect us, we'll take the GST off essential items and you won't pay GST on things like a home heating bill and to make up for any Revenue that's lost to the government, we're just going to go after big corporations and slap another tax on them. Called a windfall tax or an excess profit tax. We have plenty of time to take your call, another half hour or so. 1-833-668-2577. Three lines available there. The wait won't be too long. Let's go to Rob in Calgary today. Hi, Rob. I've got time. I'm ready for an appointment because I left early because all the snow. Okay, that's good. That's good. I'm glad you made it okay. So a point I would like to make, and, and I've heard it, Polyev, Trudeau himself, wanted to take GST on homes. Now, you have to go back to the 70s when GST first came out. Prior to that, there was no building tax on building materials used for homes. Zero. 
So when they brought the GST in, they said, okay, and I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but I'll just use some for example. Let's say a home up to $100,000, there would be no GST on any of the building materials, zero. Then from 100000 let's say to 150000 it would be prorated. So, you know, 5%, you would, you know, have to pay 5, 10 to finally over that top end, you'd get full GST tax on that home, you know, on a really expensive one back in the day. But the kicker is they never indexed that 100000 or the 150000 So it's, if you look back in the records, it's still at the 100 and the 150. So if they had indexed that like they do their paychecks and everything and government uh, MPs getting paid, I'm sure they have gone up every year keeping up with inflation, but those numbers Mm. they left alone. So this is just kind of like, this is what our government does, is they say, oh, we're going to do this, but they leave out, well, we're not going to index it, or they, you know, so they just pocket the money and, and walk away quite happy. And as far as the GST goes, Manley, who was a liberal finance minister way back when, his comment I saw on a, a talk show or TV that all the GST paid in this country goes to pay just the interest on our debt. So that's a yes. fair bit. Yes, I did so. see that. Yes, that's yeah. that's right. Yes. Yeah, you, so, I mean, right. these yeah. type of things. And I really think that they say, well, you know, you get the GST back, but there's no way that I could see that you could figure out the GST throughout a product from start to finish on every little bit. You say, well, the fuel. Well, the fuel is one thing, but how about the repairs for that truck, the initial cost of that truck, and all these things. All these mm. little things have to be factored in to find out actually what your GST is a homeowner I pay on buying a new shirt or going or buying a new vehicle or whatever, you know, and the maintenance of that vehicle because every time they take it into fix the right. GST. So this GST over oh, they give you eight hundred dollars back, but there's no way I don't think anybody can actually figure whether you're losing or making at the end of the day. Interesting, Rob. Thank you very much for your call today. Great to hear from you. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, to uh, Bruce in Gibbons, Alberta. Hi, Bruce. Yes, hi. Um, I'll, uh, I'll make a point real quickly, but I just want to say I really appreciate your show. And um, I can pick up your signal. Oh, I appreciate that. 50,000 watts and it uh, doesn't come in the clearest. But I hope you guys will consider getting some version of your station into Edmonton. But anyways, uh, regarding all this stuff of what it's supposed to be a net, net benefit for all You can all listen of... to us online. Uh, uh, yeah, Bruce, you yeah, can listen to us online, yeah. of course, uh, live online all the time uh, and get us crystal clear. You know, you listen to the podcast yeah, too, true. Bruce. So That's true. Anyways, okay. as far as it being a net benefit, I'm semi-retired. I'm trying to stay in my house, but I don't get the GST. I don't get these carbon rebate checks, so I must be just slightly over what Trudeau thinks is eligible. So this carbon tax is really affecting me. And uh, do you know what I mean? Like, I, 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 I just don't trust what Trudeau says. It, you know, like, is this unilateral? Everybody gets it? Because I'm, I'm certainly not getting any of this stuff. And uh, anyways... That's my point. I'll okay. close with this. Is it All true right. or is it Trudeau? Anyways, that's my final comment. Is it true? Is it true? Okay. All right. Fair yeah. enough. Well, again, you know, I'll just come back to the... Uh, thank you for your call, Bruce. I'll just come back to what the government says. The government says if you live in Alberta, you are paying Justin Trudeau's carbon tax in Alberta. And if you are paying it, you are supposed to get a rebate. Now, the rebate depends on on your income. You know, the lower you make, the higher your rebate, and vice versa. The average, it works out to be, for a family of four, according to the government, in Alberta is a quarterly payment of $450, $1,800 for the whole year. 
have something on your mind you want everyone to know? Call now. Hello. 1-833-668-2577. It's Talk Back on Now You Know with Rob Snow. Taxes and the cost of living. Carbon taxes. Sales taxes. Windfall taxes. All in the mix today. one 2577 to Mel in uh, Calgary. Hello, Mel. How are you doing, Rob? Thanks for the I'm, conversation you're, here You're today. welcome, Mel. I'm fine. Go ahead. What's your opinion here, Mel? Well, my opinion is um, the administration's cost to administrate all these programs, how many people has he got working doing this? It's a make-work program to hire a bunch of people to administrate. How much actually goes to carbon tax at the bottom line? Like what's the bottom? Well, line the actual tax? the actual figure that it goes into government programs of all the carbon tax that is raised, whatever the government says, ninety percent of it is rebated to Canadians, okay, and ten yeah. percent remains with the government, and the government uses that to fund all kinds of green programs, whether that's rebates on electric vehicles or helping people, you know, get heat pumps or. <laughs> Uh, investing okay, so in public transit systems, these sorts of things, sir. That, that's all well and fine, but do you think he could pay all those people that he's administ- that are doing the administration can be paid with that 10%? Well, I, 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 I don't know the answer to that. I know that Blacklock's you know, just- reporter reported some some time ago that to administer the carbon tax on an annual basis, to uh, collect it and then issue the rebate checks, was a two hundred million dollar a year enterprise for the government. Yeah, exactly. But as with any tax, just like the GST, by the time the bottom line comes, there's not much left because he's got so many people hired to control and look after it. That, that's just more okay. government waste. Do you agree? More with government that? waste. Okay. Well, I, I I do not support the carbon tax. I think it's um, yeah. I think it's proven well, to be right. ineffective as both a climate change measure and as both an affordability measure. Yeah. No, I agree. Like this, taxes are just make work programs for the government to hire more people. Okay. Okay. So this That's idea, this idea. Th- um, okay. Well, you're welcome to it, Mel, and I thank you for sharing it today. And to move along, let's go to Mark. He is in Calgary today. Mark, you're up next, sir. Here on Talk Back. Thank you for calling. What's your opinion? Hey, Rob. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, we chatted, I think, last week about uh, non-talk, non-tax for the essentials, trying to find out where to recoup some of that cost. And you may know better than I do about what about like uh, lottery winnings and gaming and betting winnings and, and taxing that more. I'm sure there's more than enough there to offset that um, okay. cost. Okay. Why don't we do that? Yeah, I don't know why we don't do that, sir. Yeah, okay. No, I'm just trying to, I appreciate all you put on there and I'm listening to everybody else. I'm trying to think of how we can make that work. And it seems like something like that would be where you can offset some of that cost. Right. Well, the NDP uh, prefers, I guess, if right now we have what we don't have any what's known as windfall taxes on, say, consumers. You know, if I win the lottery or I win money at the yeah. casino or I win money on a game show or something, I don't pay tax on that. Unlike in the United States where they have these windfall taxes. And it doesn't sound yeah. like anybody's promoting any kind of windfall tax on individual Canadians. What the NDP is pitching is a windfall tax on big corporations. For example, they determine they come up with a level. You're only allowed to make this much money in profit, and if you make any more than that, we're going to tax you at it. They do this in yeah, the UK. They do it on the big oil companies in the UK. The tax started out at 25 percent of whatever is deemed to be an excess profit, and a Conservative government did that, and they raised it to 35 percent. And then the Labour Party won the election. They raised it up to 39 percent. So they they do it. That just affects a lot more people than just one person winning a lump sum, I would think. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you, for, you for your call. Yep. You're welcome, Mark. Uh, Terry, also calling from Calgary. Hi, Terry. You're on Hello. the air, Terry. How's it going? Just fine, Terry. What's your opinion? 
just I meant to share one thing. Um, I personally, um, I do not own, uh, I do not have any electric or utility bill under my name. Um, I do not drive my personal car. I have a car a vehicle that's supplied from work. Um, okay. So I'm lucky on that. I don't pay the gas on it. I don't pay, you know, like the only thing I have under my name is actually my loan and my insurance. And um, the, the carbon tax rebate, well, there's no rebate for me. I receive an actual $130 bill um, in order uh, for me to go ahead with the carbon tax. There's no rebate for me. I, I got to pay into it on top of paying all the extra fees uh, that are coming on top with the grocery and all the rest. Uh, so I don't know what they're talking about, about uh, rebate uh, um, for, for the people in the middle class. Okay. Well, I mean, th that's your experience. I'm just telling you what Mr. Trudeau is saying. He says yeah. this is a great affordability measure. It's proven to be a success. And the car you're better off because of the carbon tax, sir. And he's going to go to his grave saying that. He's certainly going to, yeah, well, I, I shouldn't say. He's going to actually go I, into the next election saying that after raising yeah, the carbon I don't, tax. I don't know again. where they get their numbers. And you see, even they were bragging that, uh, that uh, the cost of living went lower and, you know, like everything went lower. It's because the gas was lower. Now if they put the, the carbon tax higher on the gas, then our cost of living is just going to rise again. I don't know where they get their numbers from and who they talk to, but whoever we t I talk to or anyone my, I know talk to, nobody has better money, and this program is not good for anyone. Okay, Terry. Thank you for your call. Thank you. Have good to hear one. from you. Yeah, you too. one 2577 Be right back. We'll wind Monday's edition of Talk Back down here on News Radio. Have something on your mind you want everyone to know? Call now. Hello. one 668 2577 It's Talk Back on Now You Know with Rob Snow. I have to give it to Mr. Trudeau. I he really believes in the carbon tax. I mean, that's that's the hill he's willing to die on, or at least I guess that you know the hill he's willing to suffer an election defeat over. Because even once loyal allies, politicians who once championed the carbon tax, politicians who used to sound a lot like Mr. Trudeau still sound, they've stopped defending the carbon tax because they know it's not politically popular. David Eby in British Columbia, the NDP Premier of British Columbia. I'll get rid of the carbon tax if Mr. Trudeau lets me get rid of the carbon tax. Even Jugmeet Singh uh, in Ottawa with the NDP. Doesn't sound as though he's going to spend too much political capital anymore trying to defend the carbon tax. But um, gosh, not Mr. Trudeau. Not Mr. Trudeau. He is uh, like one of the last true believers. It's like him and Gibo going down together. Right? But Mr. Trudeau made these remarks about the carbon tax at this G20 event in Brazil. He said the carbon tax, great measure to fight climate change. But it's also, it's not just a measure about climate change. It's an affordability measure because of those rebates that people get on the carbon tax. And those rebates, despite what callers did Rob Snow say, they more than offset whatever people are paying in the carbon tax. So the carbon tax, not only is it good for the environment, it's good for your pocketbook as well. And if you don't believe that, this is the other thing that Mr. Trudeau said. We should play the second half of that clip, David. Because the other thing that Mr. Trudeau said is if you don't believe what he's selling, well, then you're falling for disinformation and misinformation. Can you play that part uh, of the clip, David, please? Our fight against climate change goes hand in hand with affordability. But that's where, as I was talking about earlier, we're facing a level of attacks, of misinformation, of disinformation uh, by people who are saying, no, 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 we have to stop the fight of cl in cli against climate change in Canada so we can put a little more money in your pockets, even though that's exactly the wrong thing for the planet. And it's actually the wrong thing for money in their pockets. And that's a lot of what the next year's election is going to be about in Canada. Right. You're being misinformed or disinformed, and the people doing the misinforming and the disinforming, they just don't want to fight climate change. That's what Mr. Trudeau is saying now. But it's really the affordability message that has been the focus for us today, because what he is saying is the way that they've set up the carbon tax with the rebates going out to the people who pay the carbon tax, it's helping you cope with the higher cost of living. That it's an affordability program as much 
as an environmental program. That is that is the claim. That is the claim. And we'll see how that plays out in, in the next election. The parliamentary budget officer has been at war with the Liberals over the carbon tax. The Liberals don't like that the PBO has issued several reports over the year that have shown that people are worse off because of the carbon tax, despite the rebates. Sure, the parliamentary budget officer said, fiscally, dollars in, dollars out, the average household sees a net gain. So that's interpreted as a win for the Liberals. Most households do get more money back than they pay in carbon tax. But the PBO said, you also have to look at the entire Canadian economy. You have to look at the the economic impact of the carbon tax on the economy in terms of jobs and in terms of investment in the economy. And when you do that, then the average household see, sees a net cost and people are worse off because they pay a carbon tax despite the rebates they get from the government. Back tomorrow with another talk back, more issues and more of your calls on News Radio 